Turn on your TV, anytime, day or night, and you won't have to search very long to find a show about paranormal activity. Do you know what that is? Paranormal, as in beyond the scope of normal scientific understanding. Pretty scary, actually. At one time, even the Defense Intelligence Agency had a paranormal program. Wait, what? The DIA had a paranormal program? Yep, you heard that right. But our program wasn't on television. No commercials, no streaming, no binging, nothing like that. Ours was a United States government military psychic program. It involved the use of paranormal phenomena, primarily remote viewing for intelligence collection. The mission for the remote viewers was to describe anything they were able to see at various locations around the world known as target sites. Seems like routine stuff, right? Except by see, I mean visualize. That is the distinction. Remote viewers used visualization to ascertain information about strategic buildings, weapons, or writings on secret documents. The objective was to foresee, prevent, and counter an enemy attack. It sounds a little out there, but it really did happen. And the program's name was Project Stargate. This is DIA Connections. What if the Soviets are able to figure out ways to influence and control human behavior? Well, if they are, then we must too. And so there began this race, not the space race, not the arms race, but the psychic race. I would have to put myself in a self-hypnotic state where I had to go down and relax. And when you go down, you start visualizing. Sometimes you just know things. It's more like a, it, it just comes into the body or it comes into the mind. But when the third eye opens, you see it. The fact that I kept seeing data, I couldn't just dismiss it. There's some physics or God knows what involved here that we're simply not privy to. And that's how I came to accept it. Thanks for joining us for what should be a real mind bender. We're calling this one Strange Things at DIA. Gathering intelligence on foreign militaries to prevent and decisively win wars has been the mission at the Defense Intelligence Agency for more than 60 years. And we do it by using various conventional sources and methods, which you can easily check out on DIA.mil. On this episode, we're not going to discuss any of those. Instead, we'll be talking about a more, shall we say, unconventional approach to gathering intelligence. This is the story of a 30-year search by U.S. intelligence agencies to perfect mind control. $20 million was spent by the U.S. government over 20-plus years trying to ascertain pertinent information to national security by using psychics. We know this from declassified records made public by the CIA at the request of Congress when the program ended in 1995. The CIA played a pivotal role in initiating the program in 1972, but they ended their research five years later. DIA's direct involvement began about 1985 with three basic program objectives. Number one was operations, which was using remote viewing to collect intelligence against foreign targets. Number two was research and development, which used laboratory studies to find new ways to improve remote viewing for use in the intelligence world. And finally, number three was foreign assessment, the analysis of foreign activities to develop or exploit the paranormal for any uses which might affect our national security. Before we get into DIA's role, we thought it worthwhile to learn more about those early years when the program was called MK Ultra. That's when it was under CIA influence. Emphasis there on the word influence. The aim is controlling an individual, 
to the point where he will do our bidding against his will. Project MKUltra was a study that used the drug LSD to test its effects on mind control. And if the name MKUltra sounds a little familiar, you might just be a fan of Stranger Things, the hit sci-fi series on Netflix. A subplot of the show is rooted in the very real secret CIA program. It's referenced with regards to the character named Eleven, a girl with amazing psychokinetic abilities. Eleven, are you listening? (sighs) Yes, indeed, there were some strange things happening at the CIA and at DIA, too. Here to explain is our first guest, author Annie Jacobson. The earliest moments of the phenomena program of these various psychic programs having to do with ESP, having to do with psychokinesis, stem from those MK Ultra programs, which had to do with investigating, you know, whether or not it is possible to control human behavior. Andy Jacobson is a New York Times bestselling author and Pulitzer Prize finalist. She spoke with us about her book, Phenomena, The Secret History of the U.S. Government's Investigations into Extrasensory Perception and Psychokinesis. Annie, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Annie, let's get right into it. In your book, you write about a discovery at the end of World War II, which if it were in the wrong hands, or in this case, the wrong minds, had the potential of turning psychokinesis into a lethal weapon. Can you talk about that? It is fascinating to think that a lot of this began, and this is in my research, with the idea of that the Nazis were working on these programs. So much of that information comes from the Nazi documents which we captured after World War II. And a very specific set of Nazi documents called the Ananerbe documents, which were part of Heinrich Himmler, the Reichsführer SS sort of, you know, pet program, dealt with the occult, dealt with the things that are normally affiliated with superstitious people. And maybe the CIA and the Defense Department wouldn't have been that interested in it. Maybe they would have written this off as, you know, insane, except for the fact that the Soviets got half of the Ananerbe documents. And so there began this race, not the space race, not the arms race, but the psychic race. Okay, a psychic arms race sounds frightening. I assume that the CIA had to know what the reaction would be if this information was released to the public. The people at CIA that were involved in the very sort of origins of the actual CIA program, they were very clear about how crazy a lot of this would be seen, right? So there was under no circumstances did CIA want to be associated with this program, and yet they wanted the program at the same time, which I find kind of brilliant and fascinating. And, you know, there was a very clear set of CIA ground rules, which I found in the uh, archives, which are incredibly interesting in and of themselves. One of them was this, okay, and I'm going to quote here. It says, it makes no difference whether you are a believer or a non-believer or somewhere in between. And then I'll paraphrase here. They just go on to say, we just want to have the information about whether or not this is real. And if it is real or if it's even partially real, how can we use it? in espionage? How can we use it in intelligence gathering purposes? And they made sure to keep the program under wraps, mostly because of this reason, you know, that they didn't want anyone making fun of it. I want to step back for a second and ask you about your personal interest in this. Why the fascination with paranormal intelligence? I'm a national security reporter, so I write about war and weapons and security and secrets. And I found that this subject, it was secretive for a number of reasons. A, because it was a special access program, which made it very classified. And two, the subject matter being dealt with, extrasensory perception, also known as ESP, and psychokinesis, PK, are these incredibly 
sort of occultish, mystical, magical concepts that one does not necessarily associate with the intelligence community and the military community. And so I think a lot of the secrecy in this is sort of the double-edged sword of both of those concepts. Can you explain how psychokinesis is different than ESP? You know, extrasensory perception is like the short version of that would be mediums or psychics telling you everything from your future to I see things in your past. Psychokinesis, also called telekinesis sometimes, is a very different concept from that because it involves allegedly, the physicality of things. So in short, psychokinesis is defined as being able to perturb matter with the mind. So like affecting physical things with your mind. And remote viewing is defined as the ability to describe remote areas or concealed data via some unknown mental processes. Where and when was that term first used? It wasn't until 1972 that the program really got going at CIA, at Stanford Research Institute, a lab there out in Stanford, California. And that is where the CIA tasked some of its sort of defense contracted scientists to figure out if there was any science behind this idea of ESP. And that is where the term remote viewing was first born. After the top secret remote viewer program shifted from CIA to DIA, a medical intelligence team put together a 177 page assessment of what the Soviets were doing. It stated that they were really looking hard at electromagnetic and magnetic fields, trying to explain the paranormal through real scientific analysis. They were looking at autosuggestion, psychokinesis, ESP, dream state clairvoyance, precognition, and telepathy. Any, during that time, what was the fear in the intelligence community, and more specifically at the DIA, about mind control and the damage that it could inflict? What if the Soviets are able to figure out ways to influence and control human behavior. Well, if they are, then we must too. And the DIA's conclusion was incredibly alarmist. The original report came to four conclusions. One, we need to look into this, we being the Defense Department, because potentially military equipment could be disturbed. Two, potentially, one of these remote viewers could see our secret documents. Three, one of these individuals could potentially mold the thoughts of foreign leaders. That's an actual quote from the document. And four, could cause instant death. You know, there was an idea that psychokinesis could potentially give someone a heart attack. The program was not without its share of skeptics, but even the most pessimistic person would think that it's worth looking into because of a few factors. First, it's cheap. Only a handful of remote viewers are needed to supply espionage information. And it's passive. An enemy can't tell that you're collecting information against them. Plus, there's no defense against it. You can't put up a wall around it. Think about all the places that you would love to get a spy into. Over the 16 years of the operations effort at DIA, the total number of remote viewers never exceeded 25. At any given time, there were no more than three to five viewers available for operational remote viewing. While some were part of the team for a year or so, most others were at Fort Meade for about three to five years, and a few served for eight to 10 years. One of those that stayed in the program for a decade was Angela Della Fiora. Annie, can you tell me about Angela? She was actually an analyst at DIA, and she heard through the grapevine about this psychic program. 
Angela always felt that she had the third eye, which is this old idea, you know, going back across time that some people can see things. They were called seers. They were called diviners, people who had access to the oracle. And Angela felt that that was a gift that she had. And so she worked very hard to get herself into this psychic program when it was at Army INSCOM uh, and later at DIA. And this created an extraordinary amount of tension. There was friction between Angela and her co-workers because she identified herself as a psychic. Her abilities came naturally, and for many of the other remote viewers, that wasn't the case. When DIA took over the program, the thinking was that the Army soldiers and civilians could be trained to become psychic. After all, anything that would aid in demystifying it from the supernatural was beneficial to the program's staying power. And so you had these very masculine military individuals who are learning remote viewing because darn it, it was a skill. And then along comes Angela with her third eye and she outperforms all of them. When you say she outperforms all of them, what do you mean? What unique abilities did she have that set her apart from the others? You know, Angela was so good at so many different things that the chief of DIA's science and technology department, Jack Verona, was convinced that Angela had this talent to locate people. And so she became incredibly valuable to Dr. Verona and he gave her awards and he often used her skills above all of the other so-called remote viewers at DIA. Angela was always the one chosen for the hard jobs. I thought she was excellent. That's Dr. Jack Verona speaking about his prized remote viewer, Angela Della Fiora. We'll hear more from Dr. Verona about Angela in a moment. But first, here's a little bit about his Defense Intelligence Agency legacy and his connection to the Stargate program. In 2021, he was inducted into the DIA's Torchbearer Hall of Fame. It's an honor bestowed to former employees who distinguished themselves during their careers with extraordinary achievements. Dr. Verona came to DIA in 1964 as the head of a new unit addressing nuclear energy, eventually becoming the director of the Science and Technology Directorate. He was known to have an open mind, and he was willing to explore and change scientific norms. And that was essential in overseeing the Stargate program, which he did for 10 years. He's a DIA treasure, and we were thrilled when he graciously gave us a few minutes for a few questions about Stargate. I think you'll find his answers to be quite interesting. The first thing we wanted to know was, how was a controversial program like this able to survive for as long as it did? One of the really credible things that kept it going, 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 was it had congressional approval, high-level congressional approval. Senator Glenn, Senator Pell, Senator Nunn. I mean, these are, these are key people, right? And we asked why it was important for DIA to take over the program from the CIA. I wanted to know whether there was a threat to the, to the country or not. And so the only way you do it is you check, take the program over and determine as best you can, is it, is it fraudulent? Is there something to it? Is there a threat? Can we use it? And if, if it's a threat, what can you do to counteract it? You know, all these kind of things. Dr. Verona was once quoted as saying, the implications of this could be revolutionary. His answer surprised us when we asked if he still had doubts about its validity. Yeah. The fact that I kept seeing data, I couldn't just dismiss it. There's some physics or God knows what involved here that we're simply not privy to. And that's how I came to accept it. Finally, we asked him what he thought about Angela Della Fiora. He had once referred to her as the jewel of the Defense Intelligence Agency remote viewing program. I once asked her the question, when you're doing your thing, what can you tell us about your experience when you're out there doing your thing? 
And this is an incredible thing. I, I've never forgotten it. She told me that she met another young lady from the other side doing the same thing that she was doing from the, the, another intelligence agency, an unfriendly intelligence agency. Now that's weird. This is definitely weird. After listening to Dr. Verona and Annie Jacobson talk about Angela Della Fiora, the only thing left for us to do was to talk to her ourselves. So we did. In person. Hi. Hi, Angela. Great to be with you. Good. How are you? Thank you for having us. Angela welcomed DIA Chief Historian Paul Isaacson into her home for an enlightening discussion about her experiences as a remote viewer at the Defense Intelligence Agency. I'm Angela Dallafiora Ford, and I was remote viewer 079 in the Defense Intelligence Agency's program, Stargate. So let's start by asking you, um, at what point in your life did you realize that you had these, I guess, special abilities? At a very young age. How did you know? Because I was doing things that other people weren't. But I also knew intuitively not to talk about it. Why not? Because people wouldn't understand. Can you share with us just an example of something that was happening there? Well, I would have a lot of -of out-of-body experiences. And I think my mother was the only one I would tell because it just intuitively, I just knew. You, You just, you couldn't tell this to other kids. But I did notice at certain times in my life, and maybe at school break or when things weren't, I wasn't so busy learning new things, it it would come in again. The, The psychic abilities would come in again. Now, as I understand it, you uh, came to realize you had a a third eye? Well, it's a third eye opening. Tell us what it means to have a third eye. Well, it's one of your chakra centers. Sometimes you just know things. It's more like it, it just comes into the body or it comes into the mind. But when the third eye opens, it you see it. Information is out there and it it hits the mind. It's like a mental feat. So information is out in the ethers. And and so you're picking up information and it comes into the mind and then you verbally, verbally say what you're seeing. So there was this term out there, remote viewers, that was being used at, at Fort Meade and other places, but you identified yourself as a psychic. Was that an issue? No, when they said you're a remote viewer, a remote viewer is fine to me because that's what the government said. They had to say something when they went to Congress to get the money because remote viewing and remote viewer sounds better than, hey, we're using psychics. I understood that. During 10 years on the job, there were days when Angela was asked once or possibly twice to have a remote viewing session. And there were plenty of instances where she was unsuccessful but there were times when she was quite accurate. Two examples in particular brought attention to Angela and the program. The first was when she gave the FBI location information about a former DEA agent who had gone rogue. The next was when she identified the name of a ship off the coast of Libya almost to the letter. That ship contained chemical weapons capable of mass destruction. I suppose I could phrase this as the elephant in the room. There are certainly skeptics Mm -hmm. of psychic abilities, right? There are plenty of people that will listen to this and wonder how this, how, how is this possible or, or they'll have their doubts. So much of our work depends on facts and so forth. So how would you respond to those folks who, who may doubt this? When I worked for the government for DIA, we didn't mind skeptics. The reason being is if somebody is skeptic and they still wanted to use us, that was fine. And if we were able to give a good product and, or something worked out to help people, that was fine. What we found is that if people were really against it and it caused a lot of anger, that wasn't good for us. And a lot of times people are so against it because it goes against their belief system. 
So if somebody was really against us or didn't believe in it, we, we were better off. We didn't want them as customers. They were going to do more damage to us. Having a skeptic, we could deal with. Then on the other side, you had people that just believed in us 100%, and that wasn't good either because they would just run with the information without checking it out either. You gave me so, something new. I wasn't aware that that was so also a, a concern. skeptic isn't bad. A skeptic isn't bad. And trusting it 100% is not good either. No, it isn't. Because actually our information should have been working uh, with the other intelligence collection methods. In her book, Phenomena, Annie Jacobson writes this about Angela. Quote, There was no question that Angela's work was favored above other viewers. Her results were being shared in congressional meetings, in intelligence committee meetings, and in briefings across the military and intelligence communities. Her intelligence information was more likely to be considered by analysts, and she continued to get more tasks and produce actionable results. Walk us through, very simply, what the process was that you used to do your job. We had our desks and offices, and then there was a second building that you would walk over, and there were couches, there were big sofas, there were some beds, there were dark rooms with red lights, and it, and it was quiet. And I would have to put myself in a self-hypnotic state where I had to go down and relax. And when you go down, you start visualizing. The person known as the monitor would give me four, five, six minutes, maybe eight minutes. And then he would say, please access and describe the information in the sealed envelope known as Target A. So there is something in that envelope. It's either a picture, it's either a picture of a person. There could be a question, it could be a, just a written question, but there's something in that envelope that I need to answer. And then I would come out and I would draw pictures and write a report. Two thousand eight hundred sixty-five. That's how many remote viewing sessions were documented over the lifetime of the program. And that number was the result of being tasked by 19 different agencies. But what exactly does an RV session sound like? What you're about to hear is not Angela. We'll get back to her in a moment. This is from a session that took place prior to the program coming to DIA. The first voice is the monitor of the session, and the other voice is the remote viewer. For time purposes, his responses have been edited closer together. Okay, basically what I have here <coughs> in this sealed envelope is mm -hmm. a 200 square mile mm -hmm. map. And <coughs> the desire for information is to begin by describing the general terrain, mm -hmm. what it looks like and then to look for target areas. I had a feeling like this whole area is also used for simulated, uh, simulated combat type of things. I keep trying to get a picture of what the equipment or the material or whatever it is that's here, and I keep getting uh, I get snap impressions of chain link fences, but not in any specific place. It seems like they're all over the place in different areas. And I just get across the board all kinds of uh, military hardware. An impression of helicopters, predominantly. Uh, a real grab bag mixture of different armored type vehicles. The only specific one that comes to, to mind is uh, uh, BMP, which is a Soviet armored vehicle. I think it's got an aircraft gun. 
simulated uh, opposing force activities or plans or concepts of operation. When you're solving a problem, you get a focus, and this energy will come in and it will give you the focus, but that focus only lasts for so long. So you got to get in there and you've got to get that answer and you've got to come out. When that focus leaves you, then, then you're out of it and everything else starts coming in and then you, then you don't know. It's like you, you just know when you have it and then you've got to come out, which I think would frustrate a lot of the people that I work for because they would, they wanted more, they always wanted more information or they wanted me to stay in longer. And by that, then you're making stuff up. Thank you for explaining that. I've, I never understood how that worked. So you're, you were like, get in and get out. Get out, yeah. 20, 30, 40 minutes. Anything after 40 minutes in a session, when you're into 50 minutes in an hour, then you're into you're either repeating the information or you're into imagination, especially on locations. If people want to know where something is, you don't need to describe where it is. You need to say where it is. You either, you know, you say where it is. So you got to get in there and say where it is and get out. And I think it would just drive people crazy because, you know, it's management. It's, it's government. You know, they want reports. <laughs> Did your targets or missions change over time, especially with the fall of the Soviet Union in 91? Did you start getting different missions? We were big on the Soviet Union structures, fixed sites, they called them. We have a building here. What's going on in that building? I think we, there was one remote viewer, Joe McMonagall, that worked be there before me. I think he, he remote viewed, I think, the first nuclear submarine that the, that the Soviet Union's built. So a lot of it was fixed sites, which I did in extended remote viewing. Prior to 1991, when I started to do my channeling, I started to do hostages. I did a lot of the uh, hostages in Lebanon because the channeling or the written remote viewing also lent itself to uh, personalities. So did you have a specialty and can you give us an example of how that might have worked? I had a specialty. My specialty was known as automatic writing or channeling and that is and they called it written remote viewing. If somebody was looking for something it was good for locational work because I could tell you where something or someone was. It's better than a description. If you're looking for someone and I say, I see a tree in a mountain, well, that could be anywhere. If you're looking for someone and I can tell you a name, that's going to help you. That was my specialty. Angela was a shining star in Stargate, but her efforts weren't enough to sustain it. During the 1990s, due to several factors, the new DIA management was not keen on the program, leading to disarray. In February 1995, this led to a congressionally directed action that called for a transfer of the program to the CIA, where it was unceremoniously canceled after an independent study concluded that, quote, Enough accurate remote viewing experiences existed to defy randomness, but that the phenomenon was too unreliable, inconsistent, and sporadic to be useful for intelligence purposes. End quote. That's the official reason for ending it. Unofficial reasons run the gamut from politics, money, unrealistic expectations, lack of consistent positive results, to just too many naysayers. The definitive reason is an enigma which seems appropriate for a show about the paranormal. Once again, here's author Annie Jacobson, who has her own theory. When you're thinking of taxpayer dollars spent, certainly when it comes to the Defense Department, it is very wise to be running programs that have to do, that, that pass scientific method muster. Those are just five simple steps in any laboratory experiment. You make observations, come to a hypothesis, then you make a prediction, 
then you experiment and you draw a conclusion. And you have to be able to repeat this over and over again in order to define something as scientific. Well, remote viewing lives way outside of those bounds. And anyone will tell you, oh, it works sometimes and it doesn't work other times. That's when I say anyone, I mean someone who actually believes that this is a legitimate intelligence product. So the fact that that it cannot be relied upon makes it a poor area to spend a lot of money in, a lot of taxpayer dollars in. As for Angela Della Fiora Ford, the end of Stargate didn't mean the end of her intelligence career. She remained at DIA for 15 more years, winning numerous awards while serving her country as an analyst until her retirement in 2010. She even received high praise from a high-level admirer. William Cohen, former Secretary of Defense under President Clinton, wrote this about her in one of his books. Quote, We owe her a special debt of gratitude for lifting the veil that conceals the world of the paranormal. So looking back on your work with the Stargate program from 1986 to 1995, how did you feel about your work? Were you proud of it? Oh, yeah. I, I was very proud. I did what other people couldn't do. To learn more about the Defense Intelligence Agency, check us out on social media or go to DIA.mil. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to DIA Connections. Thanks for listening.